Good morning, Prince of Peace families and those who are watching the Daily Devotion. This is the beginning of Holy Week for us, uh, at least now, Holy Week 2020. And today we will be working on a little bit of Psalm 22 for our devotional time. I know this is uploading a little late, but that's sort of what happens with families and small children and the lack of school and all of that with the coronavirus outbreak. So Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In your, You, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. All right, kind of a strange place to end Psalm 22, but we're going to save some of it for later in the week. Um, and I'll also note that Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 are a pair. You shouldn't be reading one without the other. So I know we all love Psalm 23, and maybe you have cross-stitched pillows with it on it, or um, your your parents or grandparents or uh, church leaders made you memorize it, or you like to sing the King of Love, My Shepherd Is. That's fine. Just it's not supposed to be alone. It's not supposed to be without 22. So what's going on here in, in, in Psalm 22? Well, we stopped uh, because later on it's going to get a little more direct about the crucifixion. Uh, but throughout this, uh, we've got folks in Holy Week, especially folks on Good Friday during the crucifixion, uh, unfortunately living into this psalm and not in a good way. Uh, so we'll get to that in the second section. So uh, academically, uh, and of something of note, we have the psalmist starts out with a complaint, and then the psalmist has a statement of faith, and then there's a, there's a complaint, and there's a statement of faith. So this set sets up two sets, two really good sets of complaint that we're actually used to, at least on the first one, we're really used to this one uh, in terms of complaint. And it's a complaint that happens pretty frequently in the Old Testament, but it's also a complaint that happens all the time in our own daily life some uh, 3,400 years after, or 3,000 years after David wrote this. Um, and so here's the complaint. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night, and am not silent. What gives? This is us complaining about unanswered prayer. And maybe David is a little bit more direct about you've left me, you've forsaken me, you're not listening to me. But we all have this. We pray for something really, really hard and God is just silent and we don't hear from him. Or we go through these times in our life where we feel like God's not really there. We're doing all the same things. We're, you know, going through the motions, maybe that's the worst possible way to explain it, but and maybe it's the best, but God's not really there. And David has this. David has this in spades. And so David doesn't respond with how most 21st, 20th, 21st century Americans respond, which is, well, nuts to you, God. I'm going to go off and find a different path, and I'll get some yard Buddhas and put some Tibet prayer flags up, and, and I'll just kind of leave church. Or, the way a little bit more faithful but a little less a little harder to deal with is well then i just won't really go to church and one week turns into three turns into 17 years and i'm not really joking here uh, i've met people i meet people all the time so what we do in our complaint is really important we can have our complaint, and maybe your complaint here is about the coronavirus, or maybe your complaint is that you're an extrovert and you need all of that human interaction. By the way, the introverts are doing just fine uh, and enjoying this time alone in the quiet. <laughs> Whatever our complaint is, 
we don't wallow in the complaint. It is good and right and proper to bring our petitions to God. That's super. And now is perhaps a time to start your lament, start your complaint. And if you want to pause the video and complain at God, believe me, he's big enough to take it. And sometimes it's cathartic. I think one of the biggest problems that people have spiritually is they're afraid to actually say the complaint aloud to God. They think that somehow this will be upsetting to God or he will offend they will offend God and it's just not true. Besides, God knows what you're thinking. And if that's news or revelation to you, we need to talk. But he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows wait a minute, no. But yes. So he knows what you've been thinking, and he knows what your complaint is, and I think we need to be a little more honest with God and have that complaint and have it out. But notice what the psalmist does here. The psalmist doesn't wallow in complaint, and he doesn't get mad, and he doesn't get kind of go off in a resentful huff because he doesn't get what he wants right away. He turns back in the second half. So verses 1 and 2 are the complaint. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of Hebrew poetry, academic stuff that's kind of neato to go along here. Maybe in a different video I'll do something about Hebrew poetry. Uh, or I can commend you to go look up the uh, LCMS pastor and author, former pastor and author, uh, Chad Bird. Uh, he has quite a bit uh, on this as Hebrew poetry, and Hebrew is a specialty of his. Okay, but verse 3 and 4. This and five. This is his statement of faith. So he turns back and says, here's my complaint. Now here's what I know about you. You are enthroned in the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. So instead of saying, oh, this is how I feel and it's, and it's the only way I'm ever going to feel and, until you come and rescue me, he turns and makes a statement of faith. And this is really, really important because we see Jesus do this in a much shorter form in the garden. Take this cup from me. There's the complaint. I know, the height of complaint. Take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. And then he turns back, but not my will, but yours be done. There's the statement of faith for Jesus. And it sounds different than David's statement of faith because David has this long history to retell of our fathers put their trust in you and you delivered them. Um, but it's the same faith. Here's the next complaint. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Okay, I have to say that verse 8 is probably horrendous to translate, uh, just because Hebrew has all of this sentences where you can't tell who the he we're talking about is, and now in verse 9 you've just had, or 8, you just had tons and tons of hymns, and it's hard to say who's the him uh, that we're talking about. Notice, of course, if you have read through the Passion account, if this is not your first Easter, this is what the Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests and teachers of the law do to Jesus, right? And this is what the thief on the cross says. Get us down from here. You can totally do that. Okay, so this complaint is not maybe one that we're used to voicing. Uh, maybe this might be a good complaint if there are youth who listen to this. Uh, at least uh, the sense of going to public school, uh, it's not comfortable and we assume everybody is out to get us. Uh, I've met youth in that place. Uh, or maybe your workplace is adversarial. But this complaint is a little less common. But what he does here is exactly the same. So complaint one is complaint and then statement of faith. Here's complaint two. And now what we expect from the form is another statement of faith. And we get it. You brought me about you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast up upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. So here's a statement of faith, and not faith of this is what I've done, all the works I've done. Again, these two statements of faith are what God's done. And part of the really sneaky thing in all of this is uh, the idea of we talk about God and what he's done, and 
um, we reassure ourselves because God acts in a consistent way. We're talking ourselves into this belief thing. We're talking ourselves into comfort. Um, and it's not really kind of misleading on our part because these things really did happen. But we're talking ourselves into this by rehearsing again back what God has done for us, what God did for our parents or our grandparents, what God did in the Bible. And this reassures us, because God is consistent, that God works for the good of those who love him. So I really love this model here in Psalm 22, the first two sections of Psalm 22, um, where we get this kind of back and forth and back and forth, and this complaint to God, and then a statement of faith. And this is actually really common in the Old Testament. This is a good setup for our own devotional lives, because we do have complaints. But we do also know that God has delivered us. And I want to point out something right at the end here. And this is going to be a very much more Lutheran, Catholic, uh, Orthodox, sacramental position, um, because it relies on uh, God working on the hearts of even our littlest, littlest Christians, right? Here at the end, it says, you brought me up out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. And Here's that wonderful little part there, right? God's been working on you since you were tiny. God's been working on you since you began. And remember, we're talking about what God can do. And part of the, the ascent to the doctrine of, of, of um, infant baptism, uh, and that's not my goal here, uh, but Part of that is, it's not a human work. Belief in God is not a human work, uh, lest any man should boast, St. Paul will say. But it's what God can do. Can God make us believe in him? Yeah. Can God inspire faith? That's what the psalm said. Uh, can God inspire faith even in us now, even while we're griping and complaining and running on? Yeah, and we're doing that. And the psalm does that in a backwards way, right? It says God's doing all of this, and God's made us trust in him since the beginning. But we're actively doing this by putting God's word in our hands, by putting God's word in our hearts, and by remembering all of the things that God has done. We're going to stop there for today. Uh, we're going to kind of hit our time limit here anyway, but uh, we need to uh, close here. So as we close in prayer, uh, or as you have a time of prayer, again, remember those, those things that we don't feel like God is answering our prayers and we can just have it out. God, you aren't doing this and I want you to do it. And having that strong statement to God, uh, it's, it's valuable for a variety of reasons. But then going back and remembering, and I remember how you fixed this for me last time. I remember what you did for my grandparents. I remember all of those things. And using this as a guided kind of a formula for our devotions. Not every day. Don't gripe at God every day. Well, some of us are complainers. Um, <clears throat> But um, if that's how your heart is, then yeah, totally go there. Uh, but um, some days you just need to have it out with God. And I think especially at the beginning of Holy Week, maybe it's the time to have our griping and complaining session now and get it out of the way. And maybe your biggest complaint this week is, it's not going to feel right. It's not going to feel normal because I don't get to do X, Y, and Z. But I remember that you have placed your word on my heart, that you have placed your Holy Spirit in me through the waters of baptism, that you have called me by name, that I am yours, uh, that you have helped and supported me in this physical life, all of those things. I could keep going on and on, uh, but you get kind of the gist of where we're headed today. So, uh, this is uh, the end of the devotion. I know, kind of awkward. Uh, and uh, I wish you a blessed Holy Week and a wonderful day. God's blessings to you all.